Conservation Commission appropriate. the newsreel before the main event here. This is just just get you warmed up for the presentation. Is that going? December 23rd. hiding on the lee of the Great, thank you. So actually, before we get started, um, I'd love to just go around and hear about who you all are and just maybe a quick introduction of you and your role in the town. And if you have any questions that are sort of like burning questions about sea level rise or coastal flooding, put them out there. I've got slides, but I really wanna talk about what you all are interested in. So I'm happy to sort of ad lib a little bit from what I've put together. Um, so yeah, maybe just a quick, quick go around the room since we're a small group. Yeah. Okay. okay. So
Thanks.
the two of you who just joined, we're just going around, introduce yourselves, um, and if you, there are any particular questions you have related to coastal flooding and sea level rise, we'd love to hear them too. Sorry to put you all on the spot. <laughs> All right, thanks so much everybody. It's really helpful to hear kind of what's on your mind and it, it seems like it's a range of things and some of them I can speak to, others I can't. Um, and, but definitely I'm connected with other folks who can. So let's um, follow up afterwards if there was something on your mind that I didn't get to. Um, and as I go through, I'd love for if you just jump in with questions, don't feel like you need to hold them till the end. Um, so how many of you had heard of Gulf of Maine Research Institute before today? Oh, okay, great. So uh, our mission is to develop and deliver collaborative solutions to global ocean challenges. And we have kind of a whole range of programming at GMRI aimed at doing that. So there are scientific researchers like me who study things ranging from um, climate change to fisheries. Oh, and I'll share these slides afterwards. So if there's something interesting you see, you don't have to scribble it down, I'll, I'll just send these. Um, we have a team of educators, so most fifth graders in the state of Maine come through our building to do a hands-on science learning experience. They, they come in the building and the first thing they do is they scream, Gulf of Maine! And so you get to hear them like up in your office on the third floor, which is really kind of energizing during the day. Um, we have folks who work in community, uh, in the fishing community, providing technical assistance and um, sort of connecting uh, people who fish with fishing policy makers. Um, we have a ventures arm and then I sit in the climate center, which does um, kind of climate work that cross cuts across the entire organization. We're relatively new, but sort of the direction we're building um, is to try to deliver climate services in three buckets. So folks like me who do scientific research, um, people whose role it is to engage with community members. So we have a climate engagement specialist, a municipal engagement specialist, and then folks who really provide solutions. So we have a business climate action program supporting communities and finding financing for implementing solutions. So this is kind of the direction we're headed. And so yeah, I, I sit in this bucket and today I'm gonna be kind of creeping into these buckets a little bit, but um, not my area of expertise, but again, I'm connected with people who know more. So I'll sort of give a little teaser and um, yeah, happy to follow up later. Okay, so when we think about climate hazards along the Gulf of Maine coast, it's a pretty broad topic, and I heard a lot of them just mentioned as we were going around the room. So I'm gonna get, just give sort of a brief overview about some of, of the primary ones that I think about, and in the end, we're really just gonna sort of zone in on sea level rise and coastal flooding. Are you all familiar with this report, or the Maine Climate Council? Okay, so the, or the Maine Climate Council, are you all familiar with? Okay. Um, so it's a group of like scientists, business owners, policymakers throughout the state who have come together and written a climate action plan for the state of Maine. And one of the basis, it base, a basis for the climate action plan was this scientific and uh, this scientific and technical sub report. And so for each of these hazards, I'm going to go through. There's like a whole chapter in here that has a bunch more specific information uh, specific to Maine. So, I mean, those of you who mentioned being concerned about like farming or food production, it's getting warmer and particularly in the fall and winter in Maine. We're experiencing more intense rainfall, mostly in the summer and the early fall. Um, so some of you mentioned you've observed that here already. So there's more river flooding. So a lot of towns and communities are thinking about things like resizing culverts for a wetter future. Um, and then runoff brings pollution into the ocean with it. Um, oceans particularly getting warmer and getting more acidic, so that has all kinds of implications for fisheries. Um, and then there's sea level rise. So some of the impacts that we'll talk about today are coastal flooding, erosion, um, loss of intertidal wetlands and habitat, and uh, saltwater intrusion into aquifers. All right, so yeah, here's where we're focusing. 
Okay, it's kind of an overwhelming graphic, but I think it's helpful um, if you all end up eventually digging into looking at projections of sea level rise and coastal flooding, um, you're often gonna be looking at a single number saying like the 100 year storm is this high or sea level in the future is gonna be this high. And when we, th when we measure an extreme water level that causes flooding, it's act there are a lot of different physical drivers of water level that are all combining to cause that water level. So when we walked in, I heard one of you ask a really kind of intelligent question of, uh, as we were watching the video of the storm, like, well, how high was the tide? Um, so that's an example. There's both what the tide is doing and what the storm is doing. So this is just sort of like laying the groundwork for some of the stuff I will show later. Um, so first, there's what sea level is doing. Uh, right now, sea level is rising about 0.15 inches a year. But then year to year, sea level also varies. Seasonally, it varies by a couple inches. And year to year, it varies by three to four inches. And so one thing you'll often see in these reports is you'll say sea levels, you'll see sea levels going to rise this much relative to a, they usually give a 19 year long period as the baseline. So it's going to rise this much relative to 2000 to 2019 mean sea level. And that's because there's all of these things that vary in sea level over time. So it actually really does take like a 19 or 20 year period to figure out what sea level actually is right now. Um, and then the big thing in Maine is the tides. Um, oh, I didn't mean to put those abbreviations there. So GT, that's the, an abbreviation for the difference between mean high or high water and mean low or low water. Um, so on average around Lincolnville, it's about 10.6 feet. But the highest tide we'll experience just from like Earth, Moon, Sun alignment when things all align perfectly is 12 point, about 12.9 feet. So there's a pretty big variation there um, in terms of how high tides might be. And I think one thing that's really striking in Maine is that in comparison to that, so the, the very most extreme storm surges that we experience in Maine or in Portland over the last 100 years that we've recorded are between 3 and 4.6 feet. And they're even a little bit smaller here. So um, that's, this is just to say that like storm surge is relatively small relative to our tides. So that was like exactly the right question again. When you think about a storm hitting, it's not so much how bad was the storm, it's like what tide did it hit on top of is really gonna term determine the severity of flooding. And the moon. Sorry? And the moon. Yeah, yeah, so the position of the moon is sort of tells you where you are within this range. Yeah, exactly. And it also takes 19 years to go through like the full cycle of all the types of tides we can have. That's another reason we do sea level relative to these 19 year period baselines. Okay, so have any of you looked at this tool before from the Maine Geological Survey? Okay, now, now that we've got a little bit of sort of technical, I, I promise that complicated figure was for something, so this will now make more sense. So this is a tool from the Maine Geological Survey that takes the height of the highest astronomical tide, so that's that And then on top of that, it maps different amounts, like different water levels. So this is, I guess, kind of small, but it's highest astronomical tide plus 3.9 feet, plus 6.1, plus 8.8. And you can scroll all over the main coast, and you can see what gets inundated, so what's underwater at that water level. OK, so the scenario I've checked off here is highest astronomical tide plus 3.9 feet. That's sort of equivalent to like, absolute, absolute worst case storm surge hitting on top of absolute worst case tide. The, the chances of that happening are really, really small. But once you add in sea level rise, something like this is pretty probable by like later in the century. Um, and so one thing that I think actually like, as I go through, I think this might feel a little bit sort of like doom and gloom, but I heard someone say that in Maine we have a lot of resources and we also have a fair bit of elevation along our coast. So yes, in Lincolnville, particularly the beach area is low and vulnerable to flooding, um, but you have resources, you're thinking about this early and it's not like it's an entire town going underwater like Miami or New Orleans or something. So this is a really nice tool for sort of just like compartmentalizing where you're facing these hazards. I just scrolled around a bit with this scenario, and the only other spot that looked like it flooded was kind of near the mouth of the Duck Trap River. 
One caveat here is a lot of the time the elevations of bridges aren't quite right in these models. So I was curious, have any of you seen flooding here before? Not over the bridge. Not over the bridge. <laughs> okay. We'd be in trouble. Yeah, is the, is the bridge pretty high? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, so that's why, I, I, yeah, every right time there. in this tool, whenever you see a bridge flooding, take it with a grain of salt. Like the elevations are usually wrong on the bridges. So, okay, that's, you know, I don't have the local <laughs> knowledge there, so I was curious. Uh, okay. One thing to keep in mind with this tool, this is what we call bathtub mapping. So it's essentially saying like, um, you know, if we just filled up the earth like a bathtub with the water level being even everywhere, this is how high it would be. But you all know with a storm coming through, like you don't have this like even bathtub water level surface. There's water like getting funneled into different directions depending on which way the storm's coming from. There's waves on top of that. So this sort of mapping tool, I would consider it's a good sort of like first order estimate of what you might expect to see. Um, and the tool we use to get the really sort of detailed like estimate that accounts for dynamic storm surge and waves, that's, uh, that's through something we call dynamic modeling. Um, this is a project that's ongoing in Maine. It just started, it's funded by Maine Department of Transportation. Um, I'm working with a bunch of other scientists and a a big consulting firm and we're developing a model like this for Maine that will cover Lincolnville. Um, I think that really, and I think we'll be done with it in like 2025, <laughs> so it's quite a bit of work. Um, this is a probabilistic tool which I know that doesn't mean a whole lot, but essentially what it does is it'll tell you, it'll give you maps of like, that says this area has a 1% chance of flooding in 2100, this area has a 10% chance of flooding, this has a 20% chance of flooding. And what that does is it essentially allows for you to make decisions based on risk tolerance. So rather than having to be like, oh, do I pick the four foot scenario, the three foot scenario, like you don't have to worry about that. You just get to make decisions based on your risk tolerance. Okay, let's talk a little bit about sea level projections because um, that's where a lot of the sort of uncertainty and the planning challenges come in. I know these axes are tiny, don't worry about them. It's just kind of to make a general point. So this is showing different scenarios for, so possible futures for amount of sea level rise between the year 2020, and then all the way on the right here is the year 2100. And the thing to point out here is this goes 2150. If you look out to 2150, the range of possibilities is between two and 11 feet. So like if you're someone who's tasked with making decisions, like what the heck do you do with that kind of information? You're essentially saying, any future is possible. Um, so what I want to do is just maybe give a little bit of explanation of why that is and what the outlook is for narrowing that uncertainty. And this is getting sort of a little bit into the science weeds, but I think it's, you know, as you read the news, one of you mentioned reading about ice sheets and glaciers melting. I think this is good context to have. Any questions so far before I jump into sea level rise projections? <laughs> I know my jokes are always kind of worrisome. <laughs> we don't know, right? Yeah, it's that we don't know. All right, I think that's more meant to express like, what the heck do you do with that information? It's like not, you know, not, not terribly helpful to have a nine foot range of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll, I'll get into this in a minute, but to give you a little preview, it's essentially like two, there are two big things that are uncertain. One is what humans are going to do in terms of emissions, like you mentioned, and the other is um, we're still figuring out how um, the big ice sheets are going to react to warming, Antarctica and Greenland in particular, and I'll, and I'll explain a little bit about that. So sea level has risen about seven inches um, since the uh, early, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and two things to point out on this slide. This is showing what's contributed to sea level rise so far. So um, the two big contributors, which are this blue bar here and this red bar here, are mountain glaciers melting. So that's like, Thermal expansion. So that's just the 
interesting thing to point out, so this blue line is showing the amount of sea level rise in the northeastern US compared to the global average, and that's in gray. So we've experienced more than average, our sea level rise has exceeded the global average um, over the last 100 or so years. Um, and I think this can be kind of confusing in the news, like rates of sea level rise are reported as being really different everywhere. Um, and that's because there are a lot of different processes that drive sea level rise. And just sort of to point out about like what some of those are. The reason we have sea level rising faster in the northeastern US is that we're actually, like from a point on land, we're very slowly sinking as the land surface is readjusting from being squished by ice sheets 20,000 years ago. Yeah. Um, so rel even though that's not you know sea level rising, we experience sea level rise relative to a point on land. So if land is sinking, it seems like sea level fastest rates of that relative sea level rise are in the southeastern U.S. where they're sort of on these, these soft delta sediments and they're extracting oil and water from those sediments so they're compacting really fast. So that's why like the news uh, along the Gulf Coast is really not good. Um, second thing causing sea level to rise faster here is just changing currents. So um, the Gulf Stream has been widening lately and that causes water to sort of like slosh up against the northeastern seaboard. In Alaska, sea level's dropping um, because of just plate tectonics. Their land's actually going up, just as sort of like tectonic plates squeeze together. Um, and then sea level rise has been sort of relatively slow in California just because of kind of natural climatic variability. So that's all to say that like sea level rise rates vary place to place, um, and this is why. Okay, so let's come back to this um, uncertainty piece. So remember I told you that relatively little sea level rise so far has come from Greenland and Antarctica. So Greenland, 1.6 inches so far. If the whole thing melted, global sea level would rise 23 feet. Antarctica, quarter inch so far, and if the whole thing melted, there'd be 187 feet of sea level rise. So that's why there's all that uncertainty. And that's not to say that like these two ice sheets are going to completely melt. The thing that we're not sure about is both of them have um, physical mechanisms of instability, meaning like for Greenland, for example, part of the reason it stays frozen and is so cold is that it's at a really high elevation. As you melt it, it gets smaller, it loses elevation, now it's in warmer air. And so you get to a point with Greenland where even if we like totally stopped warming, it would just melt and melt and melt and melt and melt. Um, West Antarctica, it's more sort of like a physical thing. It's buttressed, the, the ice sheet itself is buttressed by these floating ice shelves that are breaking up. And what we're trying to figure out is once those break up and you expose these tall ice cliffs, ice cliffs, when do they collapse? And those are things that are really hard to model. <laughs> and so um, what's kind of, so the question is like, how much do you need to warm for those processes of instability to kick in? And then once they start, how fast do they go? Um, and the way that we're kind of figuring that out is by, well, your tax dollars funding science. Um, a lot of scientists are like dotting these ice sheets and instruments to essentially try to measure how they're reacting to current conditions to try to get a sense for like how they'll continue to change in the future. So one thing that's really great in Maine, um, are you all familiar with, what is it, LB1572, these sea level rise scenarios that Maine has adopted? Okay, so we're living in this time of huge uncertainty, but again, like, come back to this awesome panel of scientists that got together. There's this, um, they basically took that range of projections that's out there, and they said, okay, um, we gotta like pick something for people to act on. So they ended up choosing sea level rise scenarios foot and a half in 2050 and four feet in 2100 relative to the year 2000. And then they created a legal mandate to committing to manage these amounts of sea level rise by those times um, in its first state regulation. So despite all that uncertainty existing, Maine is really like giving, giving some guidance and encouraging communities to take action based on these targets, which is great. It sort of takes away that like all those question marks about the projections. Um, my, my take on these numbers, these are, these are relatively conservative. So to reach four feet in 2100, you have to have those ice sheets kicking in, melting, and that's pretty significant. It's attributing to sea level rise. And a 
think that makes you good targets for like being prepared to manage a future slightly different role. So, okay, this is a little bit busy, but I'll walk you through this. So one, one point to make there, um, this commit to manage scenario, don't worry about the dots, that's this blue line. So this is amount of sea level rise between now and 2150. Oh, I'm sorry if this is in the way. And the point to make here is just that if we're living in a world where we're on this blue trajectory, which is what Maine has decided we're committing to manage, we're in a world where the rate of sea level rise is accelerating. So right now we're sort of sea levels rising like slowly, slowly, steadily. That trajectory is gonna get a lot steeper if we're living in that world. So a lot of the time when you think about like how you're gonna manage future sea level, in addition to thinking about what's the actual level we're preparing for, it's also kind of the, you have to think about what rate of change are we preparing for? So like how fast are things gonna be changing in the future? And on this trajectory, it's faster than what we're experiencing now. Okay, so one more point to make about sea level rise. Um, this is a, one of the photos that you sent me. Rich, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, it's from, from December 23rd. So when I throw those numbers out, so like a foot and a half of sea level rise, that's like this, I don't know, like about this much, four feet of sea level rise, that much. That's not, that doesn't seem like a whole lot, especially relative to our big tide range. But in reality, even that pretty small amount of sea level rise can make flooding go from occasional to chronic. Um, and I'll explain why that is. So. Um, it's so great everyone in Maine just is like familiar with tides. So the height of high tide varies naturally as the earth, moon, and sun move around each other. So if you think about like the classic bell curve that describes human height, um, there most people are kind of average, some are tall, some are small. Same with tides. If you were to kind of graph what tides look like, you'd get a similar bell curve. Okay, and that's what this is showing, height, heights of high tides. This line is showing, let's just say that this is our threshold. Oh, okay, I'm showing this for Portland because I have all the tide gauge data and I could, I could do this for Lincolnville too. Um, so this, this is showing like, this is where we flood. And what you see is that right now, every, every tide that crosses this line on the right, that tide's gonna cause flooding. And right now it's only this like little, little itty bit of the bell curve. So that's the equivalent of like, you know, we build our door frames so most people don't hit their heads, and right now, only like really tall people bonk their heads on doors. Okay, so here we're just flooding, and this is in the year 2000 in Portland, we were really just flooding like a few times per year of high tides. Okay, you raise sea level only a foot and a half, and suddenly we're flooding one in four days in Portland. We go from a few days per year to every four days. And that's because raising sea level is essentially like taking this bell curve and shifting it to the right. So now you're getting into this like fatter chunk of the curve of more common high tides crossing that threshold. So like more average height people bonking their heads on doors. Then you shift four feet and then you have virtually like every high tide crossing that flooding threshold um, and you get flooding almost daily. So like same thing, even though people are like five, six feet tall, you put them on one foot stilts like everyone's gonna be hitting their heads. Okay, um, one, one other point to make about storms. One thing kind of a common like slight misconception that I often hear are that storms are getting worse in Maine. And that is true in some ways and untrue in other ways. So the past 50 years, we've experienced more frequent low pressure systems in the fall that bring like high wind, heavy rain. Like you all were talking about lots more water coming off the mountains. We're not really sure what's gonna happen in the future there. Coastal storms, so those are tropical and extra tropical cyclones or hurricanes and nor'easters, southeasters and stuff. There's no evidence that those are gonna get worse in Maine. But that being said, like think about what I like showed on that, like those early slides, like the height of like storm surge so just the rise in water level from the storm is not that big compared to like amounts of sea level rise and the height of the tides so even if storms say that stay the same if the same old storms hit on top of higher sea level we should still be prepared for more extreme and intense and uh what's the word i'm looking for frequent flooding um 
So I sort of had briefly mentioned some additional sea level rise impacts on that first slide. Um, actually, before we hop into this, there's not like a whole, oh, I'll go through a few more slides and then we'll, we'll pause and see if you all have questions. Um, so where, this is showing a diagram of ocean water meeting the coast and um, actually sort of like where the ocean water meets the coast, you end up having salt water underground in your aquifers. As sea level rises, it essentially just like increases salt water pressure at the coast. And this zone of transition from salt water to fresh water can creep towards places where you've relied on having fresh water in the past. And I know that's something that Rich has been curious about. I don't know anything about it in Lincolnville, but just you know, mentioning it as something to think about with sea level rise. Um, higher sea level also leads to more erosion. There's this kind of statistic, there's a statistic from the report that I've shown the diagram, the image of a couple times that when sea level rises, 1.6 to 39 to 70% of the dry beach area in Maine will be submerged at the highest astronomical tides. So beaches all kind of sit at a low elevation, so a little bit of sea level rise again can have a pretty big impact. Um, and I know that you all are also like, you know, a really important part of your town is the Duck Trap River and the little sand spit that's at the mouth of the river. Um, I, I don't know much about that area, but one, one thing I did do was pull up this other tool from the Maine Geological Survey that shows um, the stability of Maine coastal bluffs. Um, and so here's a map of the Duck Trap River, and I'll, I'll zoom in on that. Oh, okay, I, I covered my legend, but the red is showing if something is highly unstable. Uh, green is stable. And I can, next time I'm talking with a state geologist, I can, I can ask about this, but the way, I think this is Pete Slavinsky who did it, the way he's mapped it, um, he's showing that sort of the eastern side of the mouth of the river is what's eroding and unstable, whereas this, this sand spit seems to be pretty stable. Okay, that's all I've got on sort of the hazard side, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about adaptation and solutions, but before we do that, do any of you have questions about the, um, sort of all the hazard stuff? I mean, my best guess from looking at that is it's the direction sediment's just moving because of, um, like, like the distance wind blows over so if there's more open ocean waves can really get nasty if the wind has more distance to blow over so that's what you're talking about yeah Oh, I gave the global number. I think it's globally sea levels risen about seven inches since the in the last hundred years. Um, are you curious about the? Uh, so, so, so it wasn't the yeah, and it's a bit. It's a couple inches more than that in the northeast. I think. Um, yeah, and if you if you'd like an exact number, I can. You know, I have my email on here. Shoot me an email, and I can get it to you. Yeah. Any other questions about the hazard? side of things? Okay. 
this is usually where I pass off to a colleague. I get to tell you all what's wrong, and then someone else tells you about how to fix it. But I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best here. It's like easier being a scientist sometimes. So um, I just want to share this definition of resilience from Noah, since it's really what you all are kind of all about here. So. Coastal resilience means building the ability of a community to bounce back after hazardous events, such as hurricanes, coastal storms, and flooding, rather than simply reacting to impacts. Oh, okay. So I'm going to share um, kind of with all these big climate reports that international and national governing bodies put out. They'll often also put out frameworks for, so basically different response options. Um, for communities looking to adapt to coastal hazards. And I'm gonna kind of run through each one and share some examples. This is one that I think is often a little bit overlooked, but you know, in all the like literature and panels that are out there, like everyone, people acknowledge that this is really important. So the first is just observing and acknowledging what's going on in your community. Like I, as a scientist, like can't come in and tell you what you should be concerned about in your community. So it's really important to have you all who live here engaged in this. And so, for example, we're, um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about this later, but we have a community science program we run that encourages community members to go out and observe flood impacts. And here's a photo we got from St. George um, during a recent storm, or during, oh, this was the high tide. Yeah, January 23rd were, was sort of the highest winter tide of the year. Did you all have any flooding here on that day? Okay. Yeah, St. George flooded. Um, Climate change doesn't have boundaries the way that a lot of the other things we think about do. So you mentioned the community resilience partnership, and again, all these frameworks sort of acknowledge the importance of collaborating with neighboring communities and sort of pooling resources to meet these challenges. So for example, in the community resilience partnership, there are regional service providers who encourage communities to work together. You're eligible to apply for more money if you work for another community, you work with another community as opposed to working on your own. You all know the details there. I think it's like 50, you can get 50K if you're on your own and 100 if you're. 75. Okay, 75 each. And 50 each. That, cool. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think that's a really yeah great sort of model they have going. Then there's sort of the more traditional things we think of. So you can protect, uh, this, can't read that, protect from water. Um, you can protect your community from water by keeping water out. So as an example, here's a seawall um, uh, in Kennebunk. W one thing that's a little bit like a kind of downside of seawalls is that, um, you know, imagine yourself in a loud echoey gym with no soft surfaces. That's how a seawall treats a wave. So seawall hits, or a wave hits a seawall, it gets reflected just like adds energy to the system the same way like sound waves bouncing off an echoey room does. So you gotta be a little bit careful with seawalls. Um, there are also accommodation strategies, which are essentially you can think of as finding ways to live with water. And this project I'm sure you all are deeply familiar with, the <laughs> raising of the Route 1 bridge in Woolwich is a, an accommodation example. Um, there's also a lot of growing appreciation for and funding for nature-based solutions, which is essentially like using uh, nature's natural capacity to buffer against coastal hazards and uh, protecting your community from coastal flooding impacts. So um, <coughs> here are the main geological surveys working on stabilizing a shoreline with reef baskets that I think they filled with oyster. Mm some sort of bivalve shell, I don't know what actually. Um, but sort of the advantage of these types of solutions over um, a seawall is that they're rough, so they actually dissipate wave energy. So it's like you know, adding a really fuzzy carpet to your gym um, rather than making it more energetic. And uh, these types of systems all also have all kinds of ecosystem benefits. And then Finally, like when things get to their most extreme, communities have to move. And so far that's mostly just been impacting in the US, Alaskan native communities because they're also, it, erosion there is just, it's all magnified because they also have permafrost melting. Um, and then those com a lot of those communities in coastal Louisiana where they're sinking. And so sea level rise is relatively a lot faster there. All right, 
So this, these sort of frameworks for what you do about it are really only one side of the equation. The other side of the equation, the equation is like, who is your community and what do you care about? Um, there's no one size fits all solution. And so what is right for your community is gonna depend on your community's values and capacity. So one thing that Gulf of Maine Research Institute does, we have um, this workshop series called Planning Forward where we go into communities and we do sort of a scenario planning, kind of a game where we start by eliciting community values and then have um, kind of like move forward through time and have community members react to scenarios based on values they identify. So starting the conversation from a place of like, who are we, what do we care about is an important first step in this. Oh, here's a, I think this is me playing, doing the tool with some um, people on North Haven. Yeah. Um, we also have projects that get community members involved in observing change, sort of that first adaptation solution that I showed. Um, and I'll, I'll maybe just give an example of a project we're, we're working on. This is a slide I showed to some middle schoolers recently, but I keep the same one here, it's kind of fun. So the National Weather Service puts out flood forecasts for uh, some areas along the main coast, essentially places where they have data that they can validate their models against. And so here's some National Weather Service forecasters saying, water levels will reach 13 and a half feet on Tuesday. And if you are someone sitting in town hall, or if you're in Knox County EMA, what do you do with that information? Like what does 13 and a half feet mean? So being able to forecast water level is one side, the other side is knowing like what's the impact of 13 and a half feet. So um, like having people who are out when they know that the tide is 13 and a half feet, taking observations of the type of flooding you see. This is uh, me and a colleague out on January 23rd collecting some data for flood impacts in Portland. So this project we're doing, um, we've been installing um, some sort of like some low cost tide gauges in communities along the main coast, both to kind of fill in the gaps um, where there's, for where there's no water level data. So flood forecasting's not that good and we like don't really know what water levels are during storms. So we're doing that piece, and then we have, um, through this online platform, we have community members going to monitor flood impacts at a whole bunch of sites and contributing data that, that, we, that we can then tie to water levels to establish flood thresholds in communities. Oh, that was it. I surprised myself. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Thanks for, yeah, thanks so much for listening, and happy to take any other questions? And here's my email. I'll share the slides. Um, reach out if they come to you later. Yeah. Yeah. So we started with observing our communities, ended with um, this the online platform. Is there any way that communities or the Conservation Commission would access those to input data? In that yeah. So okay, we're in a phase right now where we're built. Um, we are piloting the program in a few communities and have funding just to do it in a few areas and then the hope is that in about a year we'll have um, like we'll have a platform that any community who's interested can just like plug into with no charge or anything um, if it's if you all are interested in kind of just like having the protocol that we're piloting to collect that information um, be happy to share it and share the network with you but we're maybe about a year away from being able to like really roll it out and if you shoot me an email, then I'll remember to send it. Yeah. Uh, are you aware of any, um, like, GIS tools or analysis that you have that you would reference that can help us with some of the monitor, monitor some of the community forecasts? For monitoring. Well, I, I know that a lot of the support's going on now is cloud Mm-hmm. Oh, gotcha. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. No one's asked me that before. I will, the first thing that comes to mind, and I'll, I'll get back to you if I think of something else, is that the, the information that's going to be provided from outside sources is going to be the hazard side. So like this is the, um, like this is how high water will be. This is how bad river flooding will be. 
the side that you need to actually like take action to like meet that hazard data is having geospatial vulnerability data. So like a, a map that shows like where are community assets that you care about, like where are the low lying roadways, where like what roads do you need to take to access a hospital? Where does an ambulance need to go? Habitat, Habitat. yeah, exactly. Um, and the state has some tools like that. From what I've observed in Maine, what it kind of feels like is that either individual towns or um, regional planning organizations are creating that those sorts of tools for themselves. So I think Meg is like the person to ask about that. Yeah, about vulnerability mapping. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's usually what happens with seawalls eventually. <laughs> um, yes, so that big dynamic model I showed that Maine DOT is funding for the state of Maine, the idea there is that if you're a community who wanted to test a solution, so like what happens if we put a living shoreline here or a seawall here, you can basically like take, like take a chunk of that model geographically and it'll be open access. So you could like hire um, an engineer with like minimal work to um, run a model, like take results from that model and then run sort of their own little local experiment for the types of questions that you asked. Yeah, it, it's, I have the frustrating answer of it depends. Like the living shorelines, for example, I've seen places where they've just gotten like chewed up right away by waves or like maybe you establish a marsh but there's like no sediment source <laughs> for it and so it can't maintain itself and other places where those things work great. Um, so one thing the state is doing is really like um, investing in tools to help with assessing the feasibility of various types of solutions geographically. So that, that's something that the main geological survey is really focused on. Yeah, um, I don't know if there's some centralized database about that. One thing, I mean, one thing that's really interesting, I love that you asked that question because a lot of the time like we, we fund these, these projects and the piece that is hard to find money for is the monitoring. Like you install a pro, you ask for all this money to do a project and then you can't get just a little more money to monitor it over like 10, 20 years. So a lot of the time we don't know. So I'd be surprised if there was some sort of a database out there, but I think it would sort of be like news story by news story looking for. Well, at least if you wanted to look at what's been done. Well. Mm -hmm. There's a really nice article that the that came out in Down East Magazine recently um, that I think looks at maybe 20 different communities and solutions they've implemented and talks about each one. So that uh, might be an interesting place to start. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's same tides on top of higher sea level. Okay. Yeah. Is the size range still the same because we're mm -hmm. seeing like negative two feet some bit sometimes as well as a plus two? Oh, okay, that's a really good question. Um, okay, yeah, so this is actually like a big question in Maine, is like is the tide range changing? So like, yes, yeah, is, is the range getting bigger? Yeah. Um, there is some evidence that yes, um, it is like it has slowly gotten bigger over the last hundred years. And I wish I knew the rate on me, uh, like off the top of my head. I can pull that up for you, but it's slow. It's something like um, I want to say it's something like five centimeters over the course of a century. So like this much, and that's because um, as sea level rises you're changing like the geometry of the Gulf of Maine essentially. Like it's like you're filling up a bathtub more and that just changes its tidal properties. And so there's some like evidence out there saying that um, as we've like made the Gulf of Maine warmer and we've made it deeper, we've amplified tides a little bit. But 
I don't think anyone would bet their life on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's ocean. Um, and there are a few prevailing theories out there. So like, one is that it's a big shallow body of water. So the same way like a puddle heats up faster than the ocean, like you get warming faster. Um, some One thing that we have observed over time is that the Gulf Stream, so that's that current that like uh, that Atlantic scale current that carries warm water from the tropics up to high latitudes, um, that current is getting wider. Um, we can just we can measure its width by looking at ocean current velocities and temperature. And you can think of like, okay, if you have a hose on the jet setting, like that's this really like skinny stream of water coming out. So that's maybe what it used to be like. And then you turn your hose to the shower setting. Um, when you turn it to the shower setting, you can get warm water kind of like leaking out the sides. And that's, that's what's happening in the Gulf of Maine. We have warm water leaking from the Gulf Stream into the Gulf of Maine. Um, again, like we don't know exactly why that is, but some of the leading theories are just that the, that big like conveyor belt of circulation is slowing down because of all the fresh water we're dumping into the ocean. Another theory is just about um, sort of like a like normal climatic cycles that will go back and forth and we we just don't really know yet. And the big concern there in the Gulf of Maine in particular is um like species range shifts. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um that is not gonna, that's not like a piece of sea level rise that is gonna, you know, cause that big acceleration in the future. That really comes from the, the ice sheets melting, but yes, the ice sheets melting. Yeah. Yeah. So for a small community in the Maine, it's just dipping its toe into the water. What's next? Where's, where do you, where do you see the next? Yeah. Um, a couple things that come to mind for me, I think like joining the Community Resilience Partnership and forming a relationship with your regional planning office and then relationships with neighboring communities to like think about acting together with solutions. I think that's like a big piece of it. Um, another is sort of like, you know, you don't, you don't need the fancy model to see the writing on the wall, like knowing like what's going to happen. And one thing I heard, uh, um, I think it was maybe a select board person say recently is like sometimes the most impactful work you can do is like digging into zoning ordinances <laughs> and so basically like anything you have like that that's sort of forward looking in terms of development is something to start thinking about now and that's something I know virtually nothing about but I, you probably know a lot more than I do. <laughs> Are there other things that come to mind for any of you being like the experts in your own town? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, but again, you should bring that to Meg. Like, ask, ask her about that. I think, like, hearing what towns need is important. Mm -hmm. That's Meg, yeah. Yeah, that's Meg. Uh, poor Meg, I'm just piling work on for her right now, standing here, but yeah. And then another person to be connected with is um, the, is it Tanya Rukowski? Is she the Region 2 Coastal Resilience Coordinator? Have you connected with her at all? Not with MCOG. Not with MCOG. She's with, um, oh, who does this fall under? It might fall under GOPIF, like the Governor, Governor's Office of Policy in the Future. There's two climate coordinators, one for kind of southern 
southern through lower mid coast Maine, and then one for mid coast and down east. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's really, right, there's the background um, warming just from temperature rising, and then there's um, the those sort of two things I talked about a moment ago. One is just that the Gulf of Maine's relatively shallow, so it's warming fast, like a puddle warms fast, and then the other is the Gulf Stream, which is carrying, it's like this jet of warm water coming by, is leaking warm water into the Gulf of Maine. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should have thrown a diagram of that on here, but yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I don't. You know, it's I don't know how much spring runoff impacts ocean temperature because it's like relatively little water coming into the, like the giant ocean. But I'm, I mean, probably does a little bit. Yeah. It does it in your experience? I mean, you, you spend lots of time on the water. Like this past year where we didn't have any snow, and all of a sudden it was warmer mm. than a year. Because if you figure out like where the Penobscot River comes from, it's from Baxter and everywhere mm. else. So if there's no snow there to run off and keep, and keep the water cool, it just seems like it stays warm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. Where do the water temperature measurements come from around here? I, well, they do have them on a buoy down on mm. Bell's Head. Okay. But um, we all have them on our boats. Oh, uh-huh. We actually check to see what the bottom temperature is, too, quite often, because that will tell us how the lobsters are moving. Mm-hmm. Okay. They need cold water at the cold water at depth. To yeah. Okay. Uh huh. All right. Thanks so much for all these questions. Anything else? Yeah, you're probably not going to be able to keep structures dry, but things you can do, um, like salt water really damages the bottom of cars, so like have alerts that go out that get cars out of the way. Um, I don't, I guess I don't really, I haven't actually gotten to visit that area that floods, but I mean, I know that like around where I live and other towns I've worked in, there's a lot of working waterfront area. And so, I mean, I was talking to a kid whose family said they lost like $10,000 worth of bait because of barrel flipped over so like securing things that might float if you have bait buckets like getting those to safety because that's has big economic consequences um so just kind of th- those kinds of things that are more mobile but yeah sandbags aren't gonna <laughs> keep water out of a general store yeah mm-hmm. um i mean one thing you can do so i mean a lot of 
Like for example, a lot of buildings right now, there's incentives out there to get rid of furnaces and put in heat pumps. And so one thing um, we're working on, on a, like a working waterfront wharf that's nearby my office is where um, like kind of coming up with a plan for replacing all the furnaces with heat pumps and figuring out, you can put those just like up on welded frames. Um, so thinking about how, like when we're gonna replace them and how high to put them so that if things do get flooded, at least you're not like gonna have pipes freeze and shut down operations for a week. Um, yeah. Yes, but I don't know any details. I just know that that does happen. <laughs> yeah, and you have to, um, like depending on the road, you'll usually build a big culvert underneath it to allow water to flow through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really excellent question. Um, I, w I think the first place, I don't know, and the first place I would look is I would go to that main climate council document, the climate plan, because it has, it lays out sort of a bunch of goals for decarbonization. And um, I don't remember how much it was like state level versus broken down sort of to the community level, but um, the office that worked on that report, I think would love to hear from Lincolnville if that's, if like what you need's not in the report and there's action you're interested in taking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's sort of at the heart of the project that we're working on. Um, so um, on, we're installing those tide gauges, we're like building the community science program. Every community we're piloting the project in, we're also um, working with the local National Weather Service Forecasting Office and the EMA so folks. Yeah. Yeah, well, so I'm this. Uh, yeah, I'm submitting the proposal like on Friday <laughs> or or like next Friday to do this. But I, um, <laughs> yeah, um, but that's. Um, let's see, what what county are we in? Waldo. Waldo. Okay, I don't know the Waldo County EMA folks. I don't think we have a community in Waldo that we're working with. Um, but I mean, again, this is like a small pilot, and the hope is that we're building something that can be scaled to other communities. So, um, like you know. Hopefully, if we get funded in like a year and a half or whatever, we'd, we'd be ready to expand and we'll be in touch. Yeah. One of your last slides, you had something about um, contraptions or predicting something. Oh, <laughs> it doesn't actually predict pre this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is. Um,
doesn't vary that much from, yeah, from standing in a wrong room during wrong room is a little far off. Uh, what's the time difference for mine? It depends where you are, yeah. But I think around here, you're sort of on like a smooth arc of coastline, and I wouldn't expect it to be all that different. Yeah, where it varies a lot is like if you go up estuaries, you can see a dueling famous, yeah. Um, but it's like, it's again more the value is that like where another place it can really vary is when a storm starts coming in, especially with like you know, you're talking about the like different wind directions having a really different impact. Um, having this place like improve the storm action, it's a little like disconnected from them immediately being helpful, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah.